<laughs> but you sound like you're awake. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity, oh God, this wonderful privilege to come here together, oh God, to worship your name and to hear from your word. Dear God, I ask that you guide me this morning as I preach, oh God, that you hide me behind your cross, that you get me out of your way so that your words might shine through. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. All right, if you'll turn once again to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to Shane for, for preaching for us last week. It's really exciting to see his continued growth in that. You know, it's, I don't know how many of you have done this before, but it's very uh, terrifying to get up here and, and speak. You know, public speaking itself is scary for a lot of people, but there's a little something extra added to it when you're supposed to be somewhat speaking for God. Okay, obviously, my words are not equivalent to God's words, but I have to be faithful in sharing God's word with you, and that, that adds a lot of extra pressure to it. So big thank you to Shane for doing that. I think he did a wonderful job. We listened on our drive back from uh, Savannah, Georgia. So just a little bit briefly about that, because it's going to fit in with what we're doing today. Uh, this time last week, we were, oh goodness, we were on our way back from Savannah driving. Saturday night, we went to Savannah, Georgia for a wedding. And have you, raise your hand, have you ever been to Savannah? Okay, I can tell you, I thought Missouri was humid. And I thought Missouri was hot, and I was wrong. It was 85 degrees was all, 85 degrees in Savannah, Georgia. The sun wasn't even directly shining, and yet, I, I don't know exactly what to call it, but I had my worst bout of heat exhaustion I've ever had in my life. We were sitting at the wedding, and all of a sudden, I felt my hands start to go numb. My head was throbbing, and, and we, had, we literally drove, you know, 13 hours out there just to go to this wedding, and then I made Kelsey leave the reception early because I was struggling to breathe, even. I was completely sapped of all of my strength. Now, here's how this relates, because this, is the, this story that we're about to read, this is about Jesus feeding the 5,000, which is the one miracle that is contained in all four of the Gospels, but there's a lot of background information to this that perhaps you haven't looked at. So as, as we're going to read this, I'll bring some of that up to you. In verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So this, after this, we, we must remember here, uh, last time I, I preached to you, we were in chapter 5, and Jesus was in Jerusalem talking about, you know, his self and his ministry to the Pharisees, to all who were around him. This, after this, could have actually been up to a year later. Could have been some time after the events of chapter 5. He went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So the Sea of Galilee was Jesus' home region. He lived around that area for the majority of his life, and most of his ministry was centered around there. All right? Then a couple other events you need to know of. So here's the cool thing. Because this is in all four Gospels, we can get lots of details about it. So in the other Gospels, we see that leading up to these events, Jesus had sent the 12 apostles on a mission trip, so to speak. He sent them out two by two to go and minister to the towns in the region. And they were just coming back from that. Also around this time, John the Baptist, who we've spoken about a few times, was beheaded by King Herod. So in the events leading up to this event, the disciples were coming back from a mission trip and they were likely both excited and exhausted. And you guys, you guys know what that's like, where you can be really excited about what just happened, but completely spent and not really wanting to do anything. And also, Jesus, along with some of his disciples, would have also been in a great time of mourning because someone they loved very dearly had just passed away. So their goal at this time and the events leading up to this was actually to get away to be by themselves for a little bit. Jesus was seeking to take them to a desolate place because he knew that they were exhausted, even though they were excited, and they were mourning. They needed a quiet place to rest and to reflect. That was their goal in the events leading up to what's about to happen. All right? He went away to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. So by this point, you can say fortunately or un unfortunately, it was really inevitable, Jesus was developing a large following. This made it hard for him to find places of solitude. 
And it also provides some information as to why when Jesus would heal people and perform these miracles, he'd just say, hey, keep this between us. Because Jesus knew that he would need time to get away, that his disciples would need time to get away. Jesus understands human fatigue, so to speak. We've spoken about that, right? Uh, they said, Jesus, you need to eat. And he said, I've got food you don't know about. Okay? He was God in the sense that he doesn't get tired all the way, but at the same time, he does get tired physically. And he knew, more importantly, that his disciples got tired. So he was seeking to get away, to give them some space, to be by themselves so they could just talk and rest and reflect. First of all, that's very important that you have a place that you can do that. Once again, if you work 24-7, 365, you will completely drain yourself. You need a place to get to where you can rest and reflect. But however, the crowd was still following. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. This is just some background information once again. He was wanting to spend quiet time with his disciples, so he took them up on a mountain to rest and get away. Now, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, if you were, you know, just reading this like a normal piece of literature, you'd say, now, why is, why is John telling us this? It really, honestly, doesn't have much to do with the surface-level details of the rest of the story. Okay, this is the only time the Passover is going to be mentioned uh, in this story. But there's a very interesting reason why it's, why it's entered in here, Okay. What are the key elements of the Passover? When we take communion, which is, which is sort of the New Testament fulfillment of what the Passover was, what do we take? What do we eat? Bread, and we drink the juice, which you know would have been wine during the Passover, okay? So when he mentions this, Jesus has already been speaking. What was his first miracle in, that he performed in the Gospel of John? He turned water into wine, okay. Then he went to the Samaritan woman and he said, hey, I have living water, all right. He, he's spoken about that because the theme of this story is gonna be about bread. So why is he mentioned in the Passover here? It's already pointing forward to the fulfillment of that Passover, of when you take the juice, when you eat of the bread, what you're actually doing. That's about what he's gonna talk about here in a little bit, all right? Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus here sees a teachable moment. First of all, he asks an impossible question. There's a good reason for impossible questions. What do impossible questions make you do? Think. Jesus wanted Philip to think for a second here. Jesus saw the crowd coming. He knew his disciples were tired and he knew they didn't have any bread. But he saw the people in need and said, we need to give them bread. Where are we gonna buy this, Philip? Where are we gonna find this bread? Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not, worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Now, we don't use that money, obviously, so let's understand this would have been about eight months' worth of wages, all right? Philip answers the question as just about any of us would answer. There was absolutely no way that they could provide this amount of food to this large of a group of people. Jesus was asking them to do something impossible. Raise your hand if God's ever asked you to do something impossible, okay? Good. It would have taken eight months' wages to be able to provide just a little bit of food for everyone. But Philip wasn't alone here. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Well, hey, we've got, you know, 5,000. Well, they haven't mentioned the number yet, but a number larger than 5,000 we got five loaves of bread and we got two fish, but that's nothing. There's something interesting uh, that I, I want you to keep in mind. Where did the bread come from here? Where did the loaves, of fi the loaves of bread and the two fish come from? Just a boy, just a random boy. We don't know his name. We don't know just about anything about him, but we're going to talk about him just briefly here in a second. All right. So let's just let this sink in for a second. That... The disciples and Jesus were trying to get away because they were exhausted, 
and they were mourning. They had just done all of this work. They had spent themselves out. They had exhausted their own resources. And they were coming away to get rest. But yet there was still work to be done. And Jesus could not turn the people away. And Jesus said, how are we going to feed these people? And they, the disciples were basically saying, we can't. In other accounts, you hear they'll say, well, send them into the neighboring villages to buy bread. And he said, no, we're going to feed them. Well, how are you planning to do that, Jesus? That doesn't make sense. This young boy was willing to share his food, which is interesting. If, if you were in a crowd of, you know, uh, the number is actually going to be about ten to 20,000 probably, 5,000 men, uh, but they didn't count as far as counting the, the women and children. So there's a good chance there were between ten and 20,000 people there. And there's this young boy who brought food for himself, the one person who was responsible, okay? He actually brought food. No one else did. He brought food in. And rather than saying, um, excuse me, sorry, there's way too many for this to go around. I'm going to feed myself. He just gives it to them. You've heard the phrase, faith like a child, right? Well, that's this phrase fulfilled right there. This boy had five loaves and two fish, which would have been a great sized meal for him, but rather he gave it away. Huh. And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Jesus does the preposterous. He instructs the people to take a seat to prepare for their meal, knowing how little he had to work with. Can you imagine if we're going to have a family night supper here, okay, and we've only got a little bit of food and we have all these people coming in and we say, sit down, we're going to eat anyways. I remember at the Valentine's Day banquet last year, or this, that was still this year. This year's been so long, it's felt like five years, I guess, okay? But the Valentine's Day banquet, we were afraid that we were not going to have enough food. And so you know what happened? We had a couple people head up and we got some extra food to bring it back because we wanted to make sure we had enough because, you know, none of us, we, we don't have the power that Jesus has, obviously. We have his power source living inside of us, but we wanted to make sure we were prepared. We didn't want to try to feed so many people with so little. But Jesus said, take a seat. We're going to feed them. It's crazy. The disciples knew that what they had was inadequate to meet the need that was set before them. But then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. Rather than focusing on the lack, because they did not have a lot, Jesus first gave thanks for what was there. This is something very important. If you ever think you don't have enough in life, start giving thanks for what you do have and watch what happens. That's the old classic hymn, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one then you'll see how much you truly have. You know, we, we've been in our house for about a year now, and as many have told me, and it's proven true, the project list never gets shorter, okay? You have all these projects you want to accomplish on your house, and it does not matter how many things you check off that list, they are just quickly replaced by something else. But you want to be content with your home, you want to be content with any possessions, start giving thanks for what you have. We got new carpet this week, and I, I've probably been getting on Kelsey's nerves, although she's been doing the same thing to me on this. Every time I step on that carpet, I say, I'm so thankful for our new carpet. And she says the same, I mean, just annoying. I wake up in the morning and my feet hit the carpet. I'm so thankful for this carpet. Because it's just, hey, we, we got this gift and it's meant to be a blessing. Let's be thankful for it and not focus on, hey, we still need to get this done. We still need to get this done. Those things need to be done, sure. But he focused on what he had here. It wasn't, oh, well, we don't have enough. It's thank you for the five loaves and for the two fish. Then when he distributed it, he let them eat as much as they wanted. Now, before I was a pastor, long ago I was a youth pastor, and even still, you know, uh, I've been buying quite a bit of pizza lately for groups, and typically when you are feeding teenagers pizza, you have to give them a limit to make sure you do not run out of pizza before everyone gets a chance, because inevitably there will be that high schooler who can eat an entire pizza by themselves, who if they did not have a limit would just take the whole thing back to the table. You say, okay, you, you, you do a little bit of math. You say, we got this many people, this much pizza, this divided by this. Here's how many pieces you can start with. Jesus didn't do that. He said, take as much as you want, eat freely. 
There are only five loaves of bread and two fish, Jesus. That doesn't make sense. To tell everyone, you know, imagine being, of those 5,000 men or the, the 10 to 20,000 people, imagine being one of the first ones to get some of that food. I mean, I can tell you, uh, there's a reason when we have family night suppers, I try to go at about the end of the line. Because that way, by the time I get there, I know I can take however much I want. If you're at the beginning, it's like, well, I, I want to make sure there's some left. He said, no, take. Take whatever you want. Take however much you want. There's plenty available. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Amazingly, but unsurprisingly, I mean, come on, this is Jesus we're talking about. But, but this was still early on for the disciples. Jesus turned the small, underwhelming, inadequate supply of bread and fish into not just enough, but more than enough. There were leftovers from five loaves and two fish for 10,000 to 20,000 people. This is, this is interesting for a few reasons. First of all, d does God waste anything? No, so realistically, if Jesus wanted to, knowing his power here, he could have made the fish and the bread spread so that there would have been just enough for everyone who was there to get food. And there would have been absolutely no leftovers. So because there are leftovers, there's a reason for there to be leftovers. In fact, so much of a reason, look at, look at the specific amount of leftovers. So they gathered them up and filled how many baskets? Twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. How many, how many apostles were there? Huh. So not only was there enough to feed everyone who was there, but there was also enough to fill up twelve baskets with leftovers. Hmm. Let's understand the lesson behind this. The disciples came to Jesus exhausted from their work. They came to Jesus with their tanks on empty. Once again, he had sent them out on a mission trip. Jesus was not there with them. This was the first time that they had went out on their own to minister to people. And so they came back and they were empty. But the little that they had, the little that they had to give, which wasn't even theirs to begin with, it was this, this boy's, the little that they had was multiplied so greatly that they would leave this place with an abundance of provisions for the road ahead. God does not waste anything. Understand, when God blesses you, he does not bless you just for you. How many of you ever feel tired? How many of you ever feel tired and then you just kneel before God and you say, God, I, I'm at the, I don't have anything left to give. Anyone ever done that? If you haven't, okay, a lot of you are tired and not a lot of you have done that. You want to get energy. You want to get power. When you are exhausted, go to God. I literally, and I've told you guys this before, but Thursday, guys, coming back to work after vacation is hard, right? Coming back, you've been, you've been, you know, traveling, just having fun, and then you come back and you have to do stuff, and all of a sudden there's a lot of stuff to do because you were gone for a little bit. Thursday afternoon, I was exhausted. I felt empty, and there was still so much to be done. I was here filling up the baptismal, actually, and I'm just thinking, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, and it was just one of those breakthrough moments of, you know what? Why am I trying to carry all this myself? And I knelt down right here and I said, God, obviously I can't do this. I need you. And <laughs> you'd think I'm lying here, but I can't tell you how many times this has happened and just the immediate response from God. Every single time, every single time where all of a sudden this peace just comes over. Oh, it's gonna be taken care of. And he gives me the strength and says, okay, here's what you do. And he guides me step by step. I got everything done that I needed to. And, and then I came here to church Sunday and I wasn't tired. <laughs> well, I was over there playing piano and I was excited this morning. Why is that? Well, when God met my need right there on Thursday, 
He didn't just meet my need for Thursday. He filled me up so that I'd still be going and still be ready to come out and give to you guys Sunday. All right? God does not waste anything, and he does not just bless you for you. He blesses you that you might be a blessing to others. Here's a great proof of that. When you got saved, God could have just said, okay, I want to keep you from the troubles that are coming on this earth, so you're saved here. Come with me. Whoop. Whoosh you up right to heaven. He could have done that, right? You wouldn't have missed out on anything, so to speak, as far as you're concerned. Really, I mean, yeah, we grow in sanctification stuff, but I think every single one of us would rather be in perfection than, you know, be in the struggles of this body, all right? He could have done that, and we would have been no worse for wear, but he leaves us here. He saves us, and then he leaves us here in this cold and sinful world, and we can think, oh, God, why would you do that? But no, think, why, God, why would you do that? Well, because he wants his word, he wants his gospel to be spread, and you're the way it's spread. He changes your life, and then that impacts other people, and he changes their life, and then that impacts even other people. God will use you to affect others. Jesus met the need that the disciples could not meet, but then he used that to equip the disciples so that the next time they needed bread, Jesus wouldn't have had to multiply it necessarily. They had provision for the next steps on their journey. We're going to see Jesus multiply some food once again. But, but just understand the principle within this. They had food not only to give there, but they also had food for their travels ahead. Every disciple would have had a basket to carry full of bread. When the people, so that's how it really affected the uh, disciples there. But when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. That's, a, that's a, one of the titles for the Messiah. Uh, that, that prophet with a capital P there. Uh, but there's something interesting about this as well. Because the people were amazed at what Jesus had done, and they began to believe that he was the Messiah. Of course. Okay, if you saw someone multiply food in that manner, this person clearly has power over the natural world. There's something greater than nature going on here. But there's something else interesting. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king... Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The people started to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but there was a problem. They were still seeking a Messiah of their own design. They saw Jesus meet their physical needs and wanted to make him king using physical force so that they would then be provided for. They wanted to get the Romans out of there, set Jesus up as king, and hey, we never have to worry about food again. He can multiply anything. He can feed all of us. Let's go make him king. But this wasn't Jesus' time, nor was it Jesus' way, and therefore he slipped away from them to get alone. Because there's something else very important we need to understand. Jesus is not just here to meet your physical needs. Does Jesus meet your physical needs? Absolutely, amen. But if your focus is just on your physical needs, watch out, you're not going to grow much. Because there's something far greater than anything physical. No matter what God gives you on this earth, this body wears out. Okay, it happens to the righteous and the unrighteous. I've, I've unfortunately done more funerals this year than I would like to do, but I've seen some very godly people pass on. So I know that the same fate happens to this body no matter how good of a person you are. So physical blessings wouldn't be enough for you. There has to be something greater than that. Jesus wants to provide for your physical needs because, you know, he just proved that here, but he has something greater in mind. He wants to heal your soul. He wants to provide for your spiritual needs. We're going to see this uh, in the coming weeks here because the people are going to come to Jesus again because they're hungry again. They want more food. And Jesus says, you're just here because you want bread. Come on. The people came to Jesus because of a hunger. You know, I think all of us who've come to Jesus have come to Jesus for the same reason. I think when we came to Jesus, and you can, you can reflect on this yourself, and you can tell me if this is true, but I can tell you that when I came to Jesus, I didn't even necessarily know exactly what I was looking for. I came to Jesus because I was in pain emotionally. I was in pain mentally, so to speak. I had set up a world for myself that had fallen apart. I had done things my own way, and I had seen the results of that, and I, for the first time in, uh, well, because 
when you're a teenager, all of a sudden you think you know everything. For the first time, well, at least I did. Uh, for the first time, I realized how much of a fool I was, and I was hurting. I didn't know theology. I mean, I had been raised in church, but I mean, I didn't really get it. And I simply came to God and, and said, I'm tired. I'm, I, I can't do this my own way. It doesn't work. I came to him because of an immediate need, because my life that I was trying to build wasn't working, but he had something greater in mind. He met the need I didn't even know that I had. Do you, do you get what I'm saying there? I hope you do. There are needs that we can perceive, but there are needs that we don't even realize that we have at times. Jesus comes to meet our greatest need, because if you meet that greatest need, all of a sudden the other ones start to take care of themselves. You, you know, compare this to a plant, all right? If you have a plant, if you have a, you know, which uh, keep in mind, I'm, I'm nowhere near a green thumb here. You have a plant that's starting to have some issues, and you can prune that plant to try to fix those issues because the issues you're seeing might be at the end. But, but if there's something wrong with the soil, it doesn't matter how many times you try to fix the surface level problem. If you're not fixing what is causing the problem, you're not going to get anywhere. Likewise, with health, okay, uh, for those of you who don't know, I've had some stomach issues over the past few years, and I could take medication for these issues, and I have at times, but the problem really is that I don't eat well, okay? Like, it, I cannot be that person who eats an entire pizza and then expect to feel good afterwards. So often, we like to try to simply treat the symptoms without actually solving the problem. Jesus does not come to just treat the symptoms. The hunger that the physical hunger they had was just a symptom. They didn't really come to him because they were hungry. They came to them because of a hunger that they had that they didn't even understand yet. But Jesus met their most basic physical need of hunger. That's what we're going to seek to do as a church when we have this food distribution coming up in a couple weeks. People need to eat. It's really hard. You know, there, when I worked in education, there was a sign on one of the walls that uh, it was a quote, and I can't remember it word for word, something along the lines of kids really struggle to think when, they're, when their stomach's empty, right? If you, you guys ever been so hungry you couldn't think? You ever tried fasting? Okay. <laughs> If you haven't fasted to the point that you've been so hungry you can't think, then you probably haven't fasted very long. It doesn't take long. I can tell you within 24 hours, I'm to the point that it's like, God, I, I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I'm out of it. I, I need food. But anywho, he met their physical need. He met their most immediate need. But he also kept his eyes on the greater prize of meeting their spiritual need of hunger through what he would do later on the cross. They wanted to make him king right there physically, but he said, no, the way I'm going to become king is different. I'm going to become king by going and dying for you. That wouldn't have made sense to any of them yet, all right? So to summarize, whereas the people came because of a hunger, they came because of a lack, they came because they wanted something that they couldn't even understand yet, the disciples came to Jesus because they were wore out. They weren't hungry. They were just tired. They needed rest, and they weren't able to get rest. And then to, cap, to uh, compound upon that, there was a need presented for them that they felt inadequate to meet. And for them, Jesus took the little that they had and multiplied it so that it was enough to meet the immediate need, plus give them supplies to meet other needs in the future. Church, I'm going to tell you in closing here, it's the same for you today. I know, I have very little doubt because, guys, humanity is mostly a common experience. We go through a lot of the same stuff. The enemy will tell you the problem you're going through. You're the only one facing it. No one else has ever faced it in the history of humanity. It's a complete lie, okay? A lot of the problems we face, many of us face. We just, we typically like to sort of hide those things from each other, which is, which is a shame, and we're going to work on that. But, but understand, there is a good chance that you are exhausted this morning. There is a good chance that the world has really got you down. It's an election year, which is just terribly stressful anyways. There's been a worldwide pandemic. Okay? Our teachers, our students, our, our administrators, they're all getting ready to go back to school. And they're going to do the best they can, but they know the mountain that's ahead of them. They know all the challenges that are ahead of them. You know, our economy, there, there are a lot of things you can be stressed out about. And you will probably feel inadequate to meet a lot of those needs. And you might be. But your true power source is not. 
The God of the universe is willing to give you the power that you need to do what he wants you to do. God will never call you to something that he will not equip you for. Okay, it's all, if he wants you to do something, he's going to give you the strength to do it. But you have to learn to go to him. Jesus didn't just multiply the bread and fish right away. First, he said to Philip, hey, where are we going to get this food? Well, we can't have enough. Oh, you're right. Here, now we will. Admit that you don't have enough. Go to God and watch what he does. He will give you the power to meet whatever that need is right there. But not only that, he will encourage you and strengthen you to prepare you for future needs. Last thing I'll say on the matter, and then we'll pray. Raise your hand, or you don't have to raise your hand on this, but you can if you'd like, if you've ever lived your life in chaos mode. And what I mean by chaos mode is where you can't focus on figuring, you know, you can't work from A to B to C, but it's like, okay, I just know I have to get something done, but you can't even get beyond that to actually, you know, feeling like you're in control. Anybody ever been there? Okay. God will meet your need in chaos mode is what I'm trying to say there, but then he will learn to take you out of chaos mode. You can't operate in chaos mode for, on a 24-7 basis. He will give you peace that passes understanding in that moment, but then he will teach you how to live so that you don't keep ending up there, hopefully. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at on this. And I've seen that proven true in my life because I was the most disorganized person probably in the world, um, and God changed that. It was where it was like, oh, God, I really need you to do this. Okay, well, I'll do that, but, but why are you getting self in this situation? Hey, if the disciples had bread with them, he would, Jesus wouldn't have had to multiply the fish. Obviously, he needed to there. But get what I'm saying? Okay? God does not want you to be in chaos all the time. He'll teach you how to live, and he'll provide for you so that you can have peace, so that you can have some sort of stability. There will still be crazy things that will come your way in life. That's okay. But he'll give you this strength to handle it and this confidence, not only in the immediate moment, but also in the future. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your power, Lord. I thank you for the might of you doing this, this amazing miracle, oh God. I wish we could just see this. For, for we've heard this story since, most of us probably since we were little. But dear God, just the, the magnitude of what you did here, not just with multiplying the food, but how you taught your disciples through it, how you taught your people through it, oh God. What a wonderful work that you did here. Dear God, please help us to find that power. Lord, l teach us to admit when we are weak. Teach us to admit when we are exhausted, to admit when we don't have enough. And rather trying, than trying to figure it out all by ourselves, teach us how to lean on you in those times. For Lord, if we learn to lean on you in those times, what can stand in our way? For greater is you who is in us than he who is in the world. Dear God, please teach us to latch on to that power. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.